There is a cruiser called New Orleans. They call her no boat son. She was the ruin of many an IJ and plan. And Lord, I'm so glad I'm not one. Hello everyone and welcome to the New Orleans class. Yeah, I couldn't resist it. I know, I have far too much with these uh, fun with these opening songs sometimes. But no, someone really should never put the idea in my head that I needed to have opening music. <laughs> it's the New Orleans class! New Orleans. Most famous for beignets, which are really, really nice. Even if I do, most of the time when I'm eating them, think they remind me of a very small Italian donut as well. So, you know, but I'm told they're of French extract, so perhaps there's something going on there. Either way, the New Orleans class. Basically, the US Navy working out exactly what they want from an 8-inch cruiser. They have... Finally realize that whatever they've been building, and there is a good argument that whatever they've been building has been slightly nuts, is not quite working for them. And is not going to produce them an actual fighting ship. But they haven't yet got to the Wichita. And the Wichita is special. The Wichita, as I've said before, is my favorite of the US Navy's cruisers because she's just cool. But no, New Orleans class, and we call them the New Orleans class, but really there is an argument for calling them the New Orleans, the Two Salusas, and the Quincy classes. Um, there is certainly a difference between the three batches of ships. New Orleans, the story in Minneapolis, are Flight 1, to use modern US Navy phraseology. Two Salusa, Tuscaloosa, and San Francisco are. Um, Tuscaloosa and San Francisco are Flight 2, and Quincy and Vincennes are Flight 3. They are pretty much the cumulative point. I would always say Wichita is more of a cumulative point for what's to come next, but many others will put the case that it's actually from the New Orleans class that the Brooklyn, Wichita, Cleveland, Baltimore class cruisers all sort of descend from. Um, uh, I would say they're still working them through, but that it also tends to end up with me making the case that Wichita in many ways is flight four of the New Orleans class. That she's this sort of moved on evolution of these ships. But no, these vessels are supposed to be, supposed to be really the last of the US cruisers completed to limitations of the 1922 and 1930 naval treaties. And I would argue they are, but I would also argue they have an interesting history. They really do. For starters, let's consider them. They have, of course, nine 8 inch 55 caliber guns, which are the same guns which have been fitted to other ships. So there's nothing really new. The US Navy has got used to these guns. They are still persisting with the idea of putting those guns at three different levels in the ship. It saves weight, I know, but it's three different levels. One of the things that comes when you're trying to aim guns is differences in height can have, well, considering relatively little, small differences in height, considering the distances you're aiming, can actually have a big impact in terms of spread. And it can make the coordination of your fire far more complicated than it needs to be. And it is. It is so much more complicated than it needs to be. Now, these ships are also interesting in that the US Navy goes for 
Well, almost the British style of magazine protection. They increase it to four inches. And um, those magazines are placed well below the waterline. It's sensible. But the fact is, the way they're designed, there's little in terms of protected hull volume. And placing magazines deep, whilst it's a very sensible idea if you think you're engaging in gun battle, turns out to be not so good if you end up getting hit by um, <clears throat> torpedoes. It's all a trade-off. It's all a trade-off. There is no good solution. This is something which... It's sometimes hard, especially for naval history students and history students to get their minds around sometimes, especially first years. But it's also sometimes difficult for naval architecture students or engineering students. There is sometimes not a good solution. There is just looking at the options and going with the least worst option for that context and that scenario. So you're designing a ship which is going to be very well protected against the effects of enemy cruiser fire. And even to an extent, larger ship fire. However, at the same time, you're going to make it weaker if it should be hit by torpedoes. Underwater damage. That is a problem. Now, before we get into this series too much, and I'm going to add, just drop this in here. Thank you to everyone for your support. Thank you for those people who watch the videos. Thank you for those people who like the videos, those people who share the videos, those people who comment, those people who are patrons, who do super chats and super thanks. Thank you to those people who donate on PayPal or Ko-fi or the various other systems I have set up. There are links at various points around this and down there in the description. Thank you. You really are helping to keep the channel going. You're helping it grow. And you're just helping me do my research and get my research done. And thank you. That's just so amazing. Because, honestly, it's now sort of sitting there sometimes I'm thinking, do I write this grant proposal, or do I spend the next day and a half recording videos, researching recording videos? The grant proposal, I maybe have a chance of one in a thousand, it seems sometimes, of actually getting the money. The videos, well, thanks to your support, they tend to always generate something. Not perhaps as much as the grant would, but always something. So. It's something I have to think about, and that's because of all your kindness and your support, so thank you. So here are the vitals of the New Orleans class. Displacement, 9,950 long tons, that's 10,110 tons. In standard. 12,463 long tons. Fully laden. Length. Uh, the waterline, 176 metres. Overall, 179.27 metres. That I means she doesn't have that rakish bow or stern, so it does have an effect on their handling. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does show you the design of the hull, the shaping of the bow, and what they're there for. And also the depth and volume of the hull. Right? Beam, 18.82 meters, or 61 foot 9 inches. Draft, 19 feet 5 inches, or 5.92 meters. That is quite a common thing. Quite a lot of cruisers are around the 6 meter draft region. And it seems to be something which various powers have sort of picked up on as a good debt for allowing them both access to certain ports and harbour infrastructure facilities 
whilst also providing them the necessary depth to counterbalance the firepower they're carrying on top. Because that is part of the job with the hull. You don't want your ship to rock too much when you're firing your guns, because if it automatically heals over when you're firing guns too far, well, then you're going to find, especially if you're doing rapid firing, there is the theoretical potential, and there was actually at least one design considered for the diodos, which the naval architects were fairly certain could do this, which would have gone boom, 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 if your hull, if you're too thin and you're too shallow and you've got too much firepower, you can do that. Theoretically. Practically, you probably won't. Because, honestly, at some point, someone's going to stop firing the guns. They're going to go, we're off target, stop firing. Hopefully, before you're past the point of tipping over and going glug, glug, glug. But, that is always something the designers actually have to consider. Propulsion, eight Babcock and Wilcox boilers supplying four Parsons or Westinghouse gear turbines to drive four shafts with 107,000 horsepower. Top speed of 32.7 knots. Not bad. 708 officers enlisted to complement. Sensors there fitted later on, but it's a Mark 31 uh, fire control system for the 8 inch main guns and a Mark 33 system for the 5 inch uh, secondaries. Armament. 9 8 inch 55 caliber guns in free triple turrets, the added principle. 8 5 inch 25 caliber guns in single mounts. And 8 50 caliber machine guns. Now, Please note, I'm going to be talking about some of the guns which are fitted, and one of the things that's interesting to note about these ships is that very quickly, when war begins, after Pearl Harbor and the sinking of the Prince of Wales and Repulse off Malaya, the US Navy goes into panic mode when it comes to AA and starts going... We will fit them with every little gun we can get, and they get festooned in quadruple 1.1-inch guns and 20mm Oracle. And so I'm going to talk about a bit about those in this video, which is why it's probably going to be about 75 minutes long. So, yes, I am going for roughly the length of an average movie. Armour, 3 to 5 inch belt. Deck, 1 and quarter to 2 and a quarter inches. Turrets. One and a half inches to eight inches in thickness. Yeah, that's a heavy chunk of metal moving around. Again, this has an effect on the stability of your hull when you've got your, these turrets moving around. Again, why it's worthwhile to start thinking about how high they are above the waterline and what they're going to be moving. Because even when you're talking about just the turret moving, that is a large chunk of metal. That is a large chunk of weight. Think about B turret on this design. <laughs> Think about how high above the waterline that is. And that's shifting around. Eight inches thick of armor. And it's not balanced. Because that eight inches on the front plate goes to one and a half inches on the aft plate. So that's going to change where the weight is balancing to. Barbets, five inches. Six and a half inches in the CA-38, and of course, number 38 is San Francisco. Conning tower. Five inches. Yes, they have a conning tower and they have the protection. It's always nice to know. So, you will have all heard, probably, of the Bureau of Ordnance. Myself and Drakenafel regularly complain about their ability to muck up torpedoes. And modern, we tend to hear about the Bureau of Ships. They have a big impact on the world. However, in the 1920s, 1930s, and even up to 1940, they are not the most dysfunctional organization in the US Navy. No. That is the Bureau of Construction and Repair. Yes, the US Navy set up a bureau which not only set its homework, but marked its own homework. They had been around from 1862 to 1940, and they made sense in 1862 when you have a small navy. 
and some have suggested it's modelled to an extent on the Royal Navy system. I'm not quite sure, because the Royal Navy system evolved quite a bit in those 78 years. The Royal Navy system, the whole team of naval constructors gets formed and professionalised and organised and in a sense separated away from the yards. And the yards are run under one team who reports up to the third sea lord, but they have their own officers and their own officials, so they have a dual line of naval officers and yard administrators. They have the sort of command going. But it's all nothing compared to how this group organizes. They are really quite interesting in terms of their structure and in terms of their command structure, especially because at points you could almost believe they don't have anyone really in charge of them and it does alternate between people the rank of chief construction a chief constructor running them and naval officers so whereas again in the royal navy there's always a sort of dual command scenario going on there's the third sea lord and then there is who's technically in charge and technically in charge of all the control is the control navy control its procurement then there's director of the naval construction in charge of the constructors and then there's the shipyards and their team their office and their ministers of the royal dockyards but they have competition from the civilian dockyards and then all the dockyards technically have a naval officer in charge as well as an admin and that naval officer technically reports to the third sea lord but you have to remember also can it will be often next posting will be going to an operational post probably under command of the first sea lord or any other commander-in-chief around the world so it's a way of ensuring that nothing gets too how do i put this that Everything that's done is done for the good of the service. And there is no, we have this problem, we're going to cover it up and pretend it doesn't exist. And that's something which I'm getting into, because the Royal Navy goes through a period where they do have that, in the 1860s. They do have that issue. And as I'm getting into, as this video goes out, there's a whole series of cruises in the 1990s, etc. At some point, I'm going to start talking about the Leander class, and I'm going to be talking about... Actually, might have already done the Leander class. I'm not sure. Have they come up already? This is on the going out on the 6th. No, the Leander class come out on the 8th. Leander class. And you'll hear about some of the issues the Royal Navy dealing with the 1890s. But the Royal Navy has to spend its time confronting this. The US Navy doesn't really confront this scenario till they get to World War II, and basically their answer is the Bureau of Ships, which is to try and rename, rechart, and reorganize everything under almost just before war breaks out. But this class of cruisers is built under this system. They are built during the tenure of, well... There is a debate as to who is in charge of them really when they're being built. Because technically they're supposed to be designed under the under Rear Admiral George H. Rock's lead. But he's in post from November 1929 to October 1932. And yes, most of the ships are laid down 1930 to 31. The last two being 33 and 34. However... Most of the ships aren't commissioned, aren't launched till 1933, 35 and 36, or and commissioned till a year after that, which means most of them are actually finished off under the Guy Pictured Command, who is Rear Admiral Emery, Emery S. Land. Now, Emery is an interesting officer. He's chairman of the U.S. Maritime Commission during World War II. 
and he was instrumental in looking over the Merchant Marine Academy and all sorts of things during in the interwar period and even during World War II. He was obsessed with submarine development. He was a really, really big fan of submarines and he'd worked on Sims, uh, Sims Command. But also, he's kind of interesting in that he spends a lot of his time, although I haven't really found much anything public of it, seemingly trying to get rid of his old bureau. Because it's interesting to note that very quickly after he lived, he's sort of in post for night October 1932 to March 1937. And very much after that, he spends quite a lot of his time, it seems, going around making the case for things need to be changed. He does, it, without him, US Navy forces, he is in many ways one of the counterparts I've looked at in, when I'm talking about Admiral Henderson. He has a big impact and his years of service do overlap quite a large chunk of Admiral Henderson's first sort of part of Admiral Henderson's first point as third sea lord. But he spends a lot of his time wrestling with the various different factions in terms of the Bureau of Ordnance, in terms of the various factions and their requests for designs of ships, and his own Bureau, which he's supposed to be in charge of, which sort of just keeps almost not listening to everyone else and then causing trouble. They do often lip service listening. And then they just carry on. So the 5 inch 25 caliber. Yeah, this is the one you don't hear about as much, but it's pretty darn important. It entered service as the standard heavy anti aircraft gun for the US Navy in the 1920s and 30s. It was designed to be a heavy AA gun that was light enough to be rapidly trained manually. And, in fact, the guns removed from battleships are often converted for submarine use by late 1943. Purpose-built version for submarines doesn't turn up till mid-1944. But you can see this outline here. This is from the USS New Mexico. These were guns which were very important at the time. They were the primary heavy AA armament of the cruiser force and if I can um whilst the Wichita, the last two of the Brooklyn's, North Carolinas, Yorktowns and etc. originally built with the modern five inch thirty eights well the Pensacola class course had these so did northamptons so did the portlands so did new orleans so did seven of the brooklands uh the lexingtons ranger nevada pennsylvania new mexico tennessee colorado class they were a standard fitting to all of them and they were capable of 14,500 yards at 40 degrees elevation or 27,400 feet at 85 degrees elevation. They could go from negative 10 degrees to plus 85 degrees. And with a muzzle velocity of 2,100 feet per second at 640 meters per second average, they're pretty darn good. They also weigh in at roughly two metric tons. And are able to be swung round by the humans that are involved using some hydraulic assistance. The 1.1 inch 75 caliber gun. Well, it's something nice to have. There is some interesting. Uh, Descriptions of it. One of my favourites comes from the US Navy Bureau of Ordnance in World War II. Uh, 
which is written by Roland and Boyd. Now, the description is this. In recognition of the growing necessity for anti-aircraft fire, the more or less continuous Bureau experimentation with double-purpose guns during the 1920s finally culminated in the early 1930s in the development of the 5-inch 38 dual-purpose gun, which fulfilled its mission throughout the war with very little criticism. While the long-range anti-aircraft gun field uh, was taken care of, except for insufficient numbers, the situation was far from satisfactory in the short-range category. Neither the 50 caliber machine gun, effective enough in plane-to-plane -plane fire at point-blank range, nor all the 1.1-inch gun, which the Bureau developed in quadruple mounts in the 1930s, were competent to meet the menace of the Second World War plane. The 1.1-inch, too heavy to serve as a last-ditch free mount, and too light to span the gap between the small machine guns and the 5-inch guns, even had all its bugs been eliminated, eliminated, the lack of adequate short-range anti-aircraft guns to go with insufficient quantities of the best guns available created a situation which by 1940 could be hardly be termed anything but critical. The fact is, though, that 1.1-inch guns are still fitted to everything they can get them onto after the attack on Pearl Harbor because they're what is available. It's a 28mm gun. One of the other interesting things to note is that these get fitted, and the next thing to come along is, of course, the 20mm Orlicon, which is fitted in other huge numbers. And the Orlicon has the advantage of being available in single mounts and double mounts and other versions, which they can put everywhere they want. Really, everyone's hunting for the 40mm. And this is where eventually the evolved pom-pom, that is the Bofors 40mm, and I call it the evolved pom-pom, if you want to know why, please go and look at the Trey Cronauer class, and you will find that the Swedes, for the free, uh, as part of the discussion of the Three Crown class, the Swedes bought some 40mm, some two-pounder pom-poms, went, hmm, we like these guns, but we think we can do them better. Handed it over to Bofors and went, can you do better? And Bofors went, hmm, what do you mean by better? Because these are very good for some rapid rate of fire. Yes, we want them slightly longer range and, you know, slightly more accurate. Okay, well, we'll see what we can do. And that is where the 40mm came from. 20mm Oricon has a very similar experience in that, basically, Oricon get weapons. They get weapons, they look at them, and they go, hmm, this is not as good as it could be. And Oricon being Oricon, they make it better. There is that Swiss streak in Oricon, which is always worth remembering. The Swiss are very, very mechanically minded, and are one of the most heavily armed nations on earth per head of per um, citizen as a in terms of a national terms because you know they do well you know you do your national service in switzerland you get to take your gun home with you they might not have a large number of the firepower you know we associate with modern nations of cruise missiles and all those things but in terms of defensive you don't want to fight Switzerland. New Orleans started off with an interesting career from the get-go. She is named, of course, for New Orleans, but she's not building New Orleans, which the former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, a gentleman called Ernest L. Jank, or Jank, J-A-H-N-C-K-E, uh, whose daughter was actually the sponsor of New Orleans, and who was the president of Yank Shipbuilding Company in New Orleans, must have found annoying. He's also said, had been the assistant secretary of Navy in, under President Herbert Hoover. But no, he returned to private life in 1933 with the inauguration of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, well, he missed out on New Orleans, being built in New Orleans. She starts off her career in the interwar period with a pretty good thing. 
she goes off on a tour of Europe. She goes to see the UK. She goes to Scandinavia. She makes visits to Stockholm, Sweden, Copenhagen, Denmark, Amsterdam, Netherlands, Portsmouth. Then returns to New Orleans. Then goes through the Panama Canal to rendezvous with the Houston, which was carrying Roosevelt. And went to Hawaii. Conducted an exercise en route with the Maxon, the uh, United States airship, and her aircraft off the California coast. She reaches Hawaii in July 1934. And then returns to Astoria, Oregon uh, in August. There the cruise ended. And she went through back through the Panama Canal and went to Cuba, and then stopped off in Los Angeles. She visited New England in 1935, then finally visited her namesake city at the end of March 1935. This was when she was en route to join the United States Fleet Scouting Force, Cruiser Division 6, which is based out of San Pedro. And from that point on, she operates along the coast of California. She takes part in various operations including fleet problem 16 between april and june it's often considered to be the largest mock battle ever staged and conducted in five separate stages over five million square miles of the north central pacific between midway hawaii and the Aleutian islands involving 321 vessels and 70,000 personnel you will notice that i'm being sort of hmm there is a reason for that, okay? As much as respect as I have for the fleet problems, especially Fleet Problem 16 and the sheer scope and size of it, there is a small issue in terms of some of the things the Royal Navy is also doing in this period in terms of major exercises. And the way some of those exercises are inter interrelated and involve the Admiralty and various points of command. So, uh, there is the fact that pr in terms of administration and delineating it as one operation, I agree, Fleet Problem 16 is probably the largest one ever built in terms of area. However, there are some sort of exercises where the Royal Navy has exercises going on on tabletop. They have them going on going on in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, in the Indian Ocean, and in the China Station area simultaneously, and they're coordinating between them. So, and those are technically administered, though, as sort of separate exercises, although they're conjoined, and there's data being fed between them as much as you can at time. So it's sort of a case of, yes, but there is also this going on, which I can see why it's not classified as, but also is of a similar scope, I would say, in terms of its outcome. So I would say it's sort of it's unique in it being abridged as one exercise, but it's something which quite a lot of navies are doing, and it's kind of interesting that both these navies are putting these sort of these massive whole world exercises on whenever they can, i.e. whole ocean, whole world exercises. Now, when the attack on Pearl Harbor happens, New Orleans was taking power and light from the dock. Her engines were under repair. Yard power, of course, went out during the attack, so New Orleans engineers raised steam, working by flashlight, while the personnel on deck fired on the Japanese attackers with rifles and pistols. The crew were actually forced to break the locks on the ammunition ready stores as they couldn't find the keys. And because the ship was taking power from the dock, well, the 5 inch 25s had to be aimed and fired manually. <clears throat> Ammunition hoist didn't have power, and it was nearly impossible for the ammunition to be brought topside to the gun crews. So, this is a real problem for ships. This is something which it's worthwhile considering the difference between Pearl Harbor and 
Toronto, where the Italian ships, even though they were alongside, were able to all give a fairly good account of themselves in terms of AA armament. But the difference, of course, is that Italy was, by that point, already at war, whereas this is an attack out of the blue. So it shows the difference between being attacked out of the blue and being attacked when at war. Even when you don't think you're going to be attacked, there is a level of preparation you already have, just in case you are attacked, versus the reality of when you are attacked completely out of the blue. New Orleans has a good career. She takes part in the Battle of Coral Sea. She takes part in the Battle of Midway and the Battle of East Solomons. And, of course, the Battle of Tassafaronga. And, well, I've already done enough videos on Tassafaronga that I'm not going to get into that too much uh, that anymore. But, you know, she does have issues after that battle. She does lose her entire bow. She does an Eskimo. Anyway. She takes part in Bombardment of Wake Island in 1943. She takes part in the attacks on the Marshals, and in 1945, she's there for, well, the uh, operations of Okinawa. Uh, after World War II, she sails with the Cruiser Destroyer Force to ports of China and Korea, covering the internment of Japanese ships at Tsingtao, evacuation of various Allied prisoners of war, um, she took part in an operation off the mouth of the Peking River. She, in 1946, is steamed to the Philadelphia Naval Yard, arrives there on 12th of March, and she's decommissioned on 10th of February 1947 and lays in reserve until struck from the Naval Vessel Register in 1959, where she sold to the Boston Metals Company, Baltimore. She received for her service 17 battle stars, which puts her amongst the most decorated U.S. ships of World War II. There have been one destroyer and four destroyer escorts named after the U.S. New Orleans, uh, USS New Orleans um, sailors killed in action. Uh, the Rogers, the Hater, the Foreman, the Swanning, and the Haynes. She was a good ship. Astoria. Well, Astoria has no less an eventful career than her sister. Astoria is constructed at the Pugent Sound uh, Naval Yard in Bremerton, Washington. Her nickname, Nasty Asty. She sunk during the Battle of Savo Island, which I'll be talking about later. But, um, yeah, she gets three battle uh, stars. At the beginning of 1939, she ended up with a special duty. This is Fleet Problem 20. And at its conclusion, Richmond Kelly Turner, commanding... Uh, makes a hasty departure, heads for Chesapeake Bay. And there she takes on a full load of supplies and stores, including the remains of the former Japanese ambassador to the United States, the late Hiroshi Saito, for the voyage to Japan. This was being done because previously, in 1926, the Japanese had returned the body of the United States Ambassador to Japan, Edgar Bancroft, in the cruiser Tama. So, Astoria sailed with... Um, the second Secretary of the Japanese Amb Embassy aboard, and of course, the ashes of Hiroshi Sato. 
she goes through the Panama Canal Zone. She is a, makes her way across to Hawaii, goes from Honolulu on the 4th of April, and basically are, are, ta are taking on board Madam Sato and her two daughters that have arrived on the Fatsuda Maru so that they can accompany the body back across. Escorted into Yokohama Homa Harbor on the 17th of April with Hibiki, Sakai, and Akutsi, uh, the Japanese destroyers escorting her. The United States ends in at half staff, the Japanese flag at the fore. This is a full naval diplomacy mission. She fires a 21 gun salute, which is returned by the light cruiser Kiso. And American sailors carried the ceremony urn ashore that afternoon. And the funeral ceremonies took place the following morning. The Japanese give absolutely lavish hospitality to the visiting cruiser. Captain Turner, that would sign, uh, Richmond Kelly Turner is her captain. Later, of course, known as Admiral Turner, but this one, Captain Turner. Um, ple uh, pleased and the ambassador to Japan. Uh, Joseph C. Crew, uh, C. Uh, crew uh, by carrying out very good diplomacy. In it, actually, this sort of there are many people who consider Turner was a very good choice for this operation, and in grateful appreciation of this and all sympathy uh, to the the family. A pagoda was presented by Hiroshi Saito's wife and child, and it's now located in front of Luce Hall in the United States Naval Academy. So if you go to Luke Luce Hall, uh, L-U-C-E Hall, in the U.S. Naval Academy, you'll find the pagoda. That is from this incident. Uh, a story then sailed for Shanghai, China, and took the support of the Asiatic Fleet, Cordices, went to Hong Kong, and then on to the Philippines and Guam, you know, did a, all these sorts of things, and then goes back to Pearl Harbor. So she's a really important ship, and really does show off her status, her capabilities, and the necessities of cruisers like this. You have to... It's not something we think about today, because today you'd send a plane, the body will be put on the plane. It might even not be a sent on the plane. It might well be the body will be put on the next airliner going back. <sighs> but in those days, this is important. This is very important diplomacy. And of course, things are delayed if the Japanese have to send a ship to pick up the body and take it back. Same with the, if the Americans, they'd have to do the same. So you sending a ship, it's important. The status of the ship you are sending is measured. If the US Navy had sent a destroyer, that would not have been good. Also, if you'd send a battleship, now you might think a battleship, that's a higher status unit than a cruiser, but that would have been slower. And that would have also not been good. Honest debate, and if they were going to have a debate at this point between anything and anything, it would have probably been an aircraft carrier versus a heavy cruiser in terms of their speed, high-speed unit. I doubt they had a much of a debate. I think they probably went for the nearest heavy cruiser they could store up and would be ready to go. And that was the Astoria. And she does this wonderful diplomacy mission. And, yeah, you have a really good officer aboard her. Turner is a very good officer at doing the naval diplomacy. He's a very good U.S. Navy cruiser officer. Then we have Minneapolis. <sighs> Minneapolis is gorgeous. She is. She also gets damaged during the Battle of Tassafaronga. What can I say? It happens. They just, you know, these ships just do not like, uh, do not do well in the Battle of Tassafaronga. 
But she gets through her war with 17 battle stars. She's built by the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. And as mentioned earlier, she is hmm, the last of the first batch. She also managed to take part in the Battle of Cerigo Strait, which is quite a cool battle. And is, of course, a key battle in the whole development of the whole Laity Gulf and wider battle that was going on. So, yeah, she's critical to that one. In fact, she pretty much at one point is the key thing supporting the destroyers. There is the left flank cruisers, and you have Louisville, Port v uh, Portland, Minneapolis, Denver, and Columbia. And Minneapolis is in the middle. And Minneapolis's fire is credited with being of such accuracy and such speed. Her crew were really trying to fire as hard as fast as they could. That Deseron 56 felt that they had the world thundering behind them. I mean, one account I've read. I do. I would say, I think Minneapolis is probably picked out because I'm reckoning the crewman who's... Well, the crew, uh, the crewman who it's... Um, who was talking about it, I think, was a Minnesotan. So I'm, I'm fairly sure that they're picking on Minneapolis because that's their cruiser name for their the city in their home state. But, and built, of course, by the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Now, this is an interesting yard. This is something which has had quite a significant history. Uh, they built a 74 ship gun on line, the Franklin. They built... New Jersey, they built Wisconsin, they built Blue Ridge, that very useful amphibious command ship, which is mm, pretty darn useful. The vessel which also now, of course, flies the first Navy Jack, as it's the oldest actively deployed vessel in the US Navy. Then you have three of the Essex-class carriers, the Antium, Princeton, and Valley Forge, built there. Um, there was USS Washington, North Carolina class, and as well as uh, New Jersey, there's of course Wisconsin as well built there. Heavy cruisers, well, it's Minneapolis and Wichita. Plus Los Angeles and Chicago. Uh, they built Philadelphia, the Brooklyn class. A fair number of destroyers, destroyer escorts, and other things built there, but really, this is a yard which does seem to savour building the heavy units. And if they build a heavy unit, it's going to be good quality. Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa. Sorry. Every time I say the name of this ship, I remember, I'm very sorry, a particular song and an episode of Scrubs. So if you haven't seen it, it's a fairly good com a hospital comedy. But you, you won't know why I keep laughing weirdly. And I do apologize. I know, she is an interesting ship. Now, after she gets into service, she takes part in Fleet Problem 16. She takes part in Fleet Problem 17. She, in fact, she's in pretty much every fleet problem up until the outbreak of war in 1939. And then she's put on a neutrality patrol. Well, she has fun on a neutrality patrol because there is this German liner, the North German, the North Jewish Lloyd line, LNDL liner, Columbus, 13th largest steamship in the world, been on a tourist cruise when war caught her. In the West Indies. She put into Veracruz, Mexico. She was fueling and preparing to make a break for home. She departed on the 14th of December 1939. Uh, Wilbold Dan, uh, Dan 
I was keeping a ship within the 300 mile neutrality zone until she was abreast of the Delaware Capes. His plan was then to head east. Tuscaloosa had been ordered out to participate and keep watch. After Columbus did a part of Veracruz, Tuscaloosa stood out of Norfolk and found a patrol solution. Uh, she relieved Cole and Ellis. And on the 19th of December, the liner spotted the British destroyer HMS Hyperion, who promptly sent a warning shot and flashed a signal, you are captured. At this point, Captain Dan decides there's only one alternative. Scuttles his ship. All but two of his crew of 578 succeeded in going over the side and manning the lifeboats. Hyperion clearly had no room for all the Germans, let's be honest. That's a massive amount of personnel and far bigger than their crew. So, the Tuscaloosa raided the Hyperion. Our orders are either you take all or none. We're warning, stay away from the votes. If you ram or sink one, we will have to commence firing on you. Which, for some reason, the British took a little bit of offence to the phrasing of. I can't think why. Because the British had been basically going, we don't have room to take them all, will you take some? And now you're accusing us of ram going to ram or sink one? Not all captains in the US Navy had Turner's ability to the diplomacy. I can understand where their phraseology is coming from because that's obviously their orders. Their orders are either you take all or none and have literally repeated out their orders. But here is the thing I would have pasted if I'd been them. And this is what I'm thinking of some other than. Either our orders are either you take all or none. We're warning, stay away from the boats. Full stop. End there. Don't add on the next part and next and the part of your orders because that is going to go back to British High Command and British High Command are going to go. Excuse me. Now, Tuscaloosa took the uh, survivors to New York. And they disembarked on Ellis Island. Ultimately, most of the Columbus officers and men returned via the Pacific to their native land. They're one of the people who actually are groups of people who do get across, which is what, of course, leads later to the Asamamaru incident and what HMS Liverpool gets up to off the coast of Japan. But again, the British were not in the habit of ramming boats, ramming lifeboats. It's not what they do. They take them prisoner, but at the moment you start ramming lifeboats, the British have a lot more people who are going to be going into lifeboats than the Germans do. Let's be honest, they could work that one out already. You're setting up a precedent that the Germans would follow it. So even if you were that way inclined, self-interest would suggest you shouldn't do it. Anyway, she has a fairly good war, and she gets involved in a fairly large number of battles and has some very interesting and capable commanders. She spends most of her war running around from one side to the other. Um, what's interesting is that when... Adolf Hitler is discussing later on in his speech to the right side declaring war on the United States. He brings up the presence of Tuscaloosa at the scuttling of Columbus two years prior, prior as a hostile act against the German nation, insisting that it force a line into the hands of British warships, listing it as a casus belli for his declaration of war. So that scenario where the Americans had been there as part of the neutrality patrol and actually picked up survivors 
had, because of the sending the full text of their orders to the British, okay, maybe you can say yes, do 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 keep away. Uh, they should send the full orders, because then the British know what they're going to do if they do something. You can make that case. But you say keep away from boats, and then if they start heading away from us, you go, if you ram, etc., da da da, we will fire on you. You send a second message. So that upset the British at the time, and later on, the fact that they hadn't got involved and hadn't fired on the British because they were a neutrality patrol, and the Germans were outside the neutral area, was used as a casus belli by the Germans, or claimed to be. Welcome to the joy of naval diplomacy. You can very easily muck it up. And poor Tuscaloosa had done... Well, she'd certainly done the right thing. Um... It's interesting that when she does go to assault out, uh, to assist with the British home fleet, mm, the British are very happy to see a heavy cruiser, of course, but not necessarily as happy to see her as they might have been others because of that history. These things get remembered by everyone. She ends up in more naval diplomacy post World War Two. Um, in October 1945, she is key in watching Chinese and Chinese nationalist and communist forces as they're jockeying for position in the formerly Japanese-controlled territories in China. And she spends a lot of time off Chifu and various other critical areas. But then she takes part in the magic carpet operations and eventually works her way back to the United States where she's placed out of commission in 1946 as she remains in the reserve until struck of the register in 1959. Like much of her class. San Francisco. Now, San Fran is another interesting ship. Her nicknames include the Frisco Maru, as well as the Frisco, and that's a kind of interesting name to get. There's also the fact that she gets a presidential unit citation as well as 17 battle stars, which is pretty darn impressive. Anyway, after her shakedown cruise, which had included visiting Mexico, and Hawaiian waters, and Washington and British Columbia, and a voyage to the Panama Canal Zone, she returned to the Mare uh, Island, uh, Island Naval Yard. Now, that's important because that's where she was built. This is where she had further gunnery installation and conversion to a flagship. She then went out and took part in Fleet Problem 16. You're going to hear a lot of that. And... In January 1939, she takes part in Fleet Problem 20. In fact, she takes part in pretty much every fleet problem she can get her hands on. Now, San Francisco entered Pearl Harbor Naval Yard for an overhaul in the 11th of October 1941. The overhaul was scheduled to begin on the 20, uh, for completion on 25th December 1941. So on the 7th of December 1941, San Francisco was awaiting docking and cleaning of her bottom. Her engineering part launch was broken down for overhaul. Or overhaul. Ammunition for her 5 inch gun, 8 inch guns had been placed in storage. Her smaller guns have been removed to permit the installation of the 1.1 inch quadruple mounts, but those hadn't yet been installed. Her 50 cal machine guns are being overhauled, and basically she only has aboard her small arms and two 30 cal machine guns. Most of her crew 
and officers are absent. The Japanese planes, when they began dive bombing at 0755 hours, well, an off duty signalman remarks this I was reading the newspaper. I just brought at the kiosk on the wharf when an airplane buzzed over my head with that big red meatball on its side. I was trained to recognize foreign insignia and knew right away it was Japanese. Telephoned down to the bridge and told the duty officer. He said, Ifkin, you're going to report for horsing around when boom. The first torpedo hit USS Oklahoma. Our guns were down, so a bunch of us climbed over to New Orleans. It's birth right next to us. We spent the next two hours feeding ammunition to their gunners. Now, that account uh, comes from a very cool series, which is all personal accounts with veterans. And it's worthwhile going and uh, you know, searching those down. They're kind of like the BBC Bite Size series. But what struck me was not only does that account turn up in many places, but that account does illustrate quite a lot of what you're dealing with for the US Navy. They weren't just sure that Pearl Harbor was safe. They honestly do not have the concept that they might be pushing their opponents to start a war. That's just not there. They're just not thinking that one through. And you can understand that. No one expects anyone to start a war. Starting a war is not a logical act. But it was coming. And it came. Mare Island Shipyard. That's a cool one. Again, one of those shipyards which has a long history in the US Navy. They start off with the USS Saginaw, which was a side-wheeled sloop of war, built in 1858. Sad enough, they stopped building ships in 1970, and from that point onwards, they're really starting to all head towards being more of a historical landmark than a shipyard. They were made a California historical landmark in 1960, and declared a National Historic Landmark District in 1975. So they have some protection, but the base closed finally in 1996. Although it has gone through several redevelopment phases in its career. Yeah, it was a good base while it lasted. USS Quincy. Ah, Quincy. Second to last of our cruisers. Now, she, of course, was sunk in the Battle of Savo Island, and she's one of the last, the batch freeze, the flight freeze, the first of those. She has another interesting interwar period. Because she sent off the naval diplomacy to go and visit the Spanish Civil War. She passes through the Straits of Gibraltar, in July 1936 and arrives at Malaga in, 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 on 27th July to assume her duties. She operated as part of the International Rescue Fleet that included the Deutschland, Admiral Graf Spey and Admiral Scheer. She was relieved by Raleigh in September. She was then sent off to take part in, unsurprisingly, the fleet problems that took place. But she later made a goodwill tour to South America uh, for more of a naval diplomacy missions. There is so much some interesting pictures of her, I think it's in Uruguay, alongside with a British cruiser that's also doing the naval diplomacy route. And it's almost like, hello, yeah, were you here too? You here? Yeah. That's not a good place to go for alcohol. That's an you know, that the food's not good there. You know, just swapping stories. It's a it's always fun when you see two ships from major powers alongside in a port for naval diplomacy, and it's basically them going, yeah, we're supposed to be probably looking like we're different, uh, protecting different interests, but in the most point, we're both we're all groups of sailors, and there's good pubs that way. Good food. Quincy spent a lot of her time 
wandering around the Atlantic as well as the uh, Pacific, and was, again, involved in neutrality patrols. But when war starts, she quickly ends up finding herself moved to the South Pacific, and taking part in various operations. But of course, she's lost in August 1942, so her war is not a particularly long one. Although, considering how much the cruisers get involved in neutrality patrol, you can argue that the cruisers at least start their war a lot earlier. And USS Vincennes. A beautiful ship. Again, lost in the Battle of Savo Island. A good ship. She was part of the escort for the Doolittle Raid. She took part in the Battle of Midway, and it's of course during the Guadalcanal campaign that she has lost to the Battle of Savo Island. But prior to World War II, she'd also had experience. Again, she is actually wandering around in September 1939. She is part of the neutrality patrols. She's in the ranging from the Caribbean Sea to the Yucatan Channel. In fact, in May 1940, as the Germans are invading France, she steams to Azor the Azores and proceeds on to French Morocco to load a shipment of gold for transport to the United States. While she's in the Azores, her comb machine breaks, and unless the sailor has to fix it, has to fix it, and for that he's offered a commission as an officer. Not bad. While at Casablanca, they got word that Italy had declared war upon France. The stab in the back, which was of course condemned by Roosevelt soon thereafter, and um, the commanding officer of Vincennes, Captain John Beardle, who will later serves as to the president, and noted that it was apparent the French bitterly resented this declaration of war and despised Italy for the actions. They successfully picked up their gold and successfully took it back to America. Again, this is a kind of interesting thing because if you think technically this is a vessel on neutrality patrol, Technically, she's picking up French gold to pay for weapons which the French are buying from America to fight the war, but oh no, no, we're neutral. It's stretching the bounds of neutrality past incredulously. Just a little bit. Just a tad. So, let's get into the Battle of Savo Island. And specifically, the action north of Savo. So, I'm going to expand this a little so you can read the map slightly better. Now, all three of the American cruisers we're talking about today, the Quincy, Astoria, and Vincennes, get sunk in the north and the action north of Savo Island. All of them. As the Japanese attacked the Allied Southern Force, the, all three captains of the US Northern Force cruisers were asleep. Their ships were steaming at 10 knots, just quietly, pretty much in a straight line. And when the crewmen on the three ships observed flares or gunfire from the battle south of Ireland, and receive Patterson's warning of uh, ships entering the area, it took some time for the crews to go to full alert. In fact, it took time for the crews to even wake their captains. Um, at 0144 hours, the Japanese cruisers began firing torpedoes at the Northern Force. And it's not till five minutes later, after they've already fired the torpedoes, that they turn on power searchlights at the three northern cruisers and open fire with their guns. Out. 
Bridge. Astoria's bridge crew called for general quarters after they saw all the flares south of the Savo Island at around 0149 hours. Now, this is still about five minutes too late, but well, about 20 minutes too late, but probably should have started doing some maneuvering at this point. And when the Japanese searchlights came on and shells began falling around the ship, Astoria's main gun director's crews spotted the Japanese cruisers and opened fire. Now, at this point, Astoria's captain, who's been awakened by all this going on, at this point, the captain, who has been asleep up until, uh, up until now and has then rushed up onto the bridge, comes, bursts onto the bridge, presumes what he's seeing is blue on blue, presumes it's firing on allies and immediately orders a ceasefire. This lasts a minute. However, unfortunately, that means that they've had a minute of them not firing, and that's a lot of shells when you're dealing with modern cruisers in World War II. Chokai had found the range, and Astoria is pretty much from this point dead. Uh, between 0200 hours and 0215 hours, Aoba, Kingsuza, uh, Keiko, and Chokai, of course, pound Astoria to, well, an inch, uh, well, basically pound it to death. Um, they destroy its engine room, they turn it into a flaming hulk, and at 0216 hours, when Astoria's remaining operational main guns fire at Kingusa's searchlight, uh, they managed to miss that, but did manage to hit one of Shokai's forward turrets, putting that turret out of action and causing moderate damage. But, um, yeah, she will sink 10 hours later after all attempts to save her have failed because she's been so damaged by the fire coming in. Quincy, well, they'd received Patterson's warning. Patterson, Patterson being a destroyer in the Southern Force, which had been signalling the whole time it could to tell and warn everyone that there were the Japanese were heading north and were going after the northern force. Anyway. Quincy therefore sounded general quarters and was coming alert when the searchlights came on. At this point, Quincy's captain is on deck and orders them to commence firing. But unfortunately, the gun crews were not ready. The gun crews had also been asleep. And within a few minutes, Quincy is caught between a crossfire of Aoba, Furtaka, and Tenru. She's hit heavily and is quickly also ablaze. So, Quincy's captain orders his ship to charge towards the eastern Japanese column. As she does so, she's hit by two torpedoes from Tenru, which cause severe damage, as can be expected from a ship which, as I mentioned earlier, the design is orientated around dealing with surface fire and gunfire, not necessarily torpedo hits, because of the way she's been put together. She manages a few main gun salvos, one of which hit Chokai's chart room, and didn't well it got rather close to admiral mikawa who was in charge of the japanese but didn't kill him at 0210 hours the incoming shells killed or wounded quincy's bridge or bridge crew including the captain and at 0216 hours she's hit by another torpedo this time from Mayoba, and her remaining guns are silenced when Quincy's assistant gunnery officer goes to the bridge to ask for instructions, he finds it a shamble of dead bodies with only three or four people still standing. In the pilot house itself, the only person standing was the signalman at the wheel, who was vainly endeavouring to check the ship's swing to starboard to bring out a port. On questioning him, I found out that a captain, who at the time was laying near the wheel, had instructed him to beach the ship, and he was trying to head for Savo Island. Distance some four miles on the port quarter. 
I stepped to the port side of the pilot house and looked out the file in the island and noted the ship was healing rapidly to port, sinking by the bow. At that instant, the captain straightened up and fell back, apparently dead, without having uttered any sound other than a moan. Mm. Quincy sank, bow first, at 0238 hours. Vincennes, well, she hesitated to open the fire, believing the searchlights might be friendly ships. And her captain was really second-guessing himself, until Keiko opened fire on her. As Vincennes began receiving damaging shell hits, Captain Frederick L. Rekhoff, Raff, Raff, Riffel, her commander, ordered an increase of speed to 25 knots. Unfortunately, She's hit at 0155 hours by two torpedoes from Shokai, causing heavy damage. Then Kingusa joins Keiko in pounding. And this is something that the Japanese are really doing. Pounding away at Vincennes. Vincennes managed to cause some damage to the Japanese, including moderate damage to the steering engines of one ship. However, very quickly... The Japanese ships are focusing on Vincennes, and at this point, she's hit by roughly 74 shells, and then another torpedo, this time from Ubai. This means all her boiler rooms are destroyed, uh, she's burning everywhere again, and at 0216 hours, her captain orders the, abandon crew, uh, the crew to abandon ship, and she sinks. The escorting destroyers, Helm and Wilson, struggled to see the Japanese ships and basically caused no damage and received no damage themselves despite trying to fire. And this was the Battle of Savo Island. The thing is, You can do big war, uh, big exercises. You can do all the training and selection you can put in. But there's a mentality to being at war. And there's a mentality to being at war in such a big scenario as you are in a world war. And that was a problem for the US, for the British, for everyone. There was a problem in the, uh, getting those wars and understanding them. And this affected how the ships were used. So sometimes when we critique classes, and you can hear this, people go, oh, well, all these ships were sunk, or this ship was sunk, or that from. People start going, oh, well, they were sunk because of this fault in the design, or this fault in the design. And it's not. Savo Island, the battle takes place not a long time into the war. It takes place in 1942, August 1942. The war is nine months old, almost. Well, yeah, sort of. It is eight months of August, so it's nine months old. The Japanese have been winning fights. They have been attacking at night up to this point. You're in the Solomon Islands. I can understand there being a level of confidence. But honestly, these crews... And it starts from top down. You, you, you can't work yourself to death as a captain. You have to... You have to pace yourself. Because you are the person who has 30 years of experience. You're in charge for a reason of a very valuable asset. So I don't expect them to all be awake. Although I'm surprised all three are asleep. It would perhaps have seemed sensible for maybe an informal chat to have been worked out that um, usually there's at least one senior officer on one of the ships awake. It would have seemed sensible. 
there are scenarios where British officers do work out some. There are scenarios where American work officers work out similar during later in the war. So I think perhaps that's a sort of lesson of fighting a war on the scale you're fighting in World War. It's something which is drummed in, not necessarily something they do they do at the beginning. And I think one of the problems you often get in the Allies' perspective is there is often a comparison between the British and the American forces. And you compare them in the wrong years. Technologically, you should not compare the American forces of 1941-42 with the British forces of 1939-1940. They are... There are generations of technology which have come in at a time, and have been implemented at that time. But you can compare, in a way, the mentality and the understanding of what the reality of war is of those two groups in 1939, 1940 for the British, 1941, 42 for the Americans. And they both suffer from the same problems. And it's almost as if, despite there having been World War One, despite there having been those massive wars, there hasn't been an inoculation of the idea this can happen again, and this is how you deal with it when you're dealing with war, when you're not dealing with a small nation which will do be limited, when you're dealing with someone who is a peer, as a peer level threat, the level of forces they can bring, the level of area of action they can achieve, the all those things. And it's difficult for them. This battle and the Battle of Tassafronga, which are both massive losses of heavy cruisers, are considered two of the worst defeats in US naval history by some historians. I'm not sure. They're certainly tough. They are certainly problematic for the Americans. And they lose a lot of valuable assets. But I'm not sure I would consider them the worst defeats of the US Naval Navy. Because ultimately they learn a lot from them. And there are defeats which they suffer which they don't learn from. And I would always consider a defeat to be worse if you don't learn from it. And I would say they don't learn from those defeats because what then comes next is what they do learn from. But we'll leave that to one side. That's an entirely different debate. So I normally finish these videos off with a question, but this has been a rather long video. I think I said about 75 minutes. It's probably going to be about 90. I don't know. I'll probably cut and ja uh, chop some bits because it's been recorded in multiple parts. And so far, I've recorded the question three times. And I've changed the question every time. And I'm going to put it this question. How would you, with the advantage of hindsight, but this is a question that's worth our thinking about. How would you go about ensuring your personnel have the easiest adapt adaptation to a major war scenario? How do you inoculate in your forces preparation for the realities of fighting a major war? And it's worthwhile thinking about these days because we keep seeing reports in the papers and various things of threats of conflict over various issues between the major powers. And there is always the distinct chance that it stays conventional and is a major peer-on-peer -peer conflict. In which case, how do you prepare your crews for it? How do you get them thinking along those lines and able to understand it? I'd like to hear your opinions and ideas on this. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and thank you as ever for your support. Take care.